This is the Pioneer Growing Point Agronomy Podcast. Welcome to the podcast that talks everything agronomy and only agronomy, tackling current agronomy topics, management strategies, and covering topics generated from our listeners. On this episode, we will discuss corn and soybean fungicide applications. And now your hosts, DuPont Pioneer Field Agronomists, Josh Schaffner and Brian Buck. Josh, things are cooking along here this summer. It's just past the midpoint in July, and uh, there's a lot of corn tasseling out there, and the crop development's moving along good. And I think with that, a lot of questions come about fungicides. Yeah, they do. This time of year, every year we get a lot of questions on fungicide. And the main question being, is this the year that I should spray or is this the year that I shouldn't spray? And and it's an important question, fungicide being a very expensive input, uh, but one that can have a very positive impact on your crop if, if things are lining up on a year to benefit from fungicide. And today, Brian, we're just going to kind of go through some bullet points or a bit of a checklist to maybe help our listeners make those decisions a little bit easier. Yeah, that sounds good. So let's talk corn first and looking at, you know, spraying fungicide on corn. So, you know, one of the things I look at first is, you know, you got to talk or you got to say, are you chasing yield or are you chasing agronomic? So the difference there being, you know, you can spray fungicide and strictly go after yield, that break even point, try to make good enough bushels back to pay for it. But there's a lot of growers out there that maybe farm a lot of acres or know they're not going to get to fields until late in the season. Uh, and they'll also spray just for the agronomic reasons, right? You can have really good harvestability late in the season, and it just ensures that you're going to have a good crop there later on in the year. Yeah, I always say some of the best ways to, for someone that maybe hasn't used fungicide that has a lot of acres of corn, the best way to do it is maybe spray your last two farms and kind of see how it shakes out. In a lot of cases, uh, I when I get growers to do that, they say they get a very positive experience from that. So the other thing, Brian, is scouting. I think it's extremely important to walk your fields, um, to take a look for what kind of diseases are present ahead of these applications. And the really the main one I'm going to be looking for is probably northern corn leaf blight. Uh, Brian, you and I have seen a little bit in some fields that we've walked together. You know, we're seeing that show up ahead of tassel. Obviously, it, it's out there. Conditions are, are favorable to get it developed. There's inoculum there. And then, you know, what's the environment going to be like moving forward? And is it going to, you know, be a high risk disease or, or not? But that's one thing I like to do is take a look at what diseases are present in my fields. Yep. Yep. Don't overthink it. If you're out in a field and you have a lot of disease pressure, I think that's a good one to earmark for spraying. So, you know, you talked a little bit about weather the next two weeks. So, you know, I think one important thing is where's the crop stage at currently? You know, are we at tassel in mid-July or are we at tassel in mid-August? Generally, Josh, something mean, uh, we talk about quite a bit is the earlier we get tasseled, it seems like the better response chance we get from fungicides. But also, you know, if you think about disease development, if you look out the next two weeks and you have that 65 to 80 degree weather and it's going to be, you know, high dew points or just wet weather in general, humid, whatever, uh, we're going to have heavy dews in the mornings. There's a lot better chance for disease development over the next two weeks and it makes it a lot easier to pull the trigger also. Yep, for sure. Today we're sitting at 1,344 heat units for our geography, southeast Minnesota, 35 above the 10 year average. And with early planting dates, Brian, a lot of corn in April planted this year. You know, we're sitting really, really good on crop development. Uh, The next thing, Brian, is field selection, uh, something that's extremely important if you're trying to target fields that got the highest risk for disease pressure or the most likely to have a positive response to fungicide and really want to focus on corn on corn acres, maybe specifically those longer range corn on corn acres. Or as we get east along the Mississippi River, you know, corn on corn acres that are maybe in some low valleys that get a lot of dew, a lot of fog, don't get dried out quite as quick because obviously the longer leaves are wet or your canopy is, is damp, the more likelihood you're going to have the diseases that fungicides are going to control. Yep. You know, so you talked about field selection, that corn on corn. I think another thing that we need to consider, and I think this is a question we get common, commonly, is, you know, hybrid variety selection. So I have hybrid a planted does this mean i should should i spray this farm or shouldn't i so it is a piece of the puzzle and i think if you look down your hybrid list you know some things i always look for is what's the northern corn leaf blight score so the lower that score i think the more likely i generally you know am willing to you know suggest spraying so that's the number one thing i key up on when you look at hybrid and variety selection although anthracnose is another good one to look at uh, just because that's also controlled by the fungicide yeah those are two of the probably most common ones you want to look for 
um, from a yield standpoint and the anthracnose from a yield and harvestability standpoint and proving that stock quality down the stretch. Uh, Brian, can't forget about economics. I mean, break even is important. You know, we look at commodity prices today. You look at the cost of fungicide applications, you know, to apply fungicide, it's going to be around $30, give or take. You know, some cases, depending on application, maybe as low as 26 you know, maybe as high as 32 probably in that ballpark. So if you look at the current commodity prices, you know, we're probably looking in the ballpark of needing, you know, 10 bushel to hit that break-even point. And it's just important to kind of know what is your break-even based on the cost of the uh, application and the fungicide versus what your corn prices currently are. So you talked about economics, and you really think about, you know, if you want to have the best chance of getting your money back, uh, timing is really imp an important piece of that. So uh, if you're too early, you're probably going to give up some bushels, and if you're too late, you're going to give up bushels. So making sure that timing is right is the best way to get the money back. And that timing window is VT to R2. So VT meaning 100% of the tassels are emerged. So not 50% or 75%, but making sure all those tassels are out and emerged. Um, on the back side of that, we talked about R2. That can float a little bit later to R3 if it needs to. You should miss late ever before you should miss early. In R3, Josh, the simple way you know to point that out is brown silk. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, with the season we've had with the frost hit early, you know, we do have some uneven tassel emergence within the field. But Ryan, we had an extremely wide planting window this year. You know, started planting. April 13th, 14th, somewhere in that range. You know, maybe some growers didn't wrap up till middle of May. So again, we got a wide range of tassel emergence. That's just something that, you know, it can be a challenge to manage that, especially if you're having it done aerial where, you know, maybe your applicator isn't going to give you a chance to come back two or three times. But, but really the timing is king in this. If you miss the timing, really all the other factors we just talked about, Brian, can be thrown out the window because the timing really is the the key factor of getting fungicides to give you a good return on investment. Yep, and you pointed out, you know, getting the applicator there. Anytime, you know, just another call out, anytime you can get an aerial applicator to go from that two gallons an acre to three is a huge plus also on efficacy. So it's worth spending a couple extra bucks if that's what it takes to get the three gallons instead of two. Uh, easier said than done sometimes, but a good thing to call out also. And from a ground standpoint, Brian, we want to be targeting a minimum of 15 gallons and nothing wrong with being up there at 20 gallons. In most cases with fungicide applications, more water the better. Yeah, Josh, so just to sum this up, it's really about prioritizing risk. So we talked about quite a few different factors, but if you're checking off four or five of the seven, there's a pretty good chance you're going to get your money back on your investment or a good chance you're going to ensure a really good harvest come late fall. So Ryan, let's shift gears over to soybeans. And soybeans, we look at a little bit different where maybe you don't evaluate as many things or have a big checklist, but really when it comes to beans, timing is king. Yeah, so you think about timing in soybeans, R3 is the stage you really wanna hit. Uh, Josh, R3 is the stage where you have 3 16 inch pod in one of the four uppermost nodes on the plant. So it's not a huge window to hit, but it's the window, if you can hit it, you have pretty consistent returns and you know I think nice responses from using fungicide. For sure. It's, it seems like if you hit that window, you get a very consistent three to five bushel response. The challenge we're having, Brian, is in a lot of cases, a lot of growers want to tank mix something with fungicide. They don't want to go out there and just spray it standalone. But with our herbicide programs today, you know, we're, we have all that done prior, usually to R1. In a lot of cases, our, our soybean aphids are coming a little bit later, maybe R4 or a little bit beyond that. So it's just a balancing act. In some cases, the, the bugs line up, aphids line up with it really well. Some cases that don't, it's just some factors that you gotta take a look at. Yeah, and you know, we hit said R3, that is where you're gonna get the most bang for your buck. If you have to cheat it a little bit and float it one way, you always wanna float it a little later, if anything, into R4. But really hitting R3 is where the most bang for the buck is at. Yeah, for sure. And some beans just hitting R3, some not there yet, but certainly take a close look at those before you make that decision. Brian, that's kind of a, a wrap up for the things we wanted to cover today. Uh, finding our podcast, I think it's always important to share with the listeners where to find our podcast shows. All right, so some different ways you can get it. If you talk to your local Pioneer sales rep, uh, you can get on the opt-in email update list. Uh, that that way it just gets emailed to you whenever it comes out. Another place you can find it is on Twitter. I'm at FarmerBuck1. I am at Josh Schaffner. If you just check us out, we'll uh, tweet out the link when it comes out. And the last place is on YouTube.com. If you search either of our names in Pioneer, uh, it should pop up. Also, the list of everything we've done in the past. 
past well is housed down there and that'll pop up also all right brian that's a wrap for this week's podcast this podcast is recorded from the agronomy bunker studio in zombrota minnesota it is produced by brian buck and josh schaffner this is a bi-weekly podcast thanks for listening and be sure to tune in next time